Okay. Um, in recent years, it's become evident that experiences that people have early in life can have an impact on how you manage stress across the lifespan and ultimately on your health in adulthood. Um, it probably wouldn't have come as much of a surprise to you to know that people who go through intense traumas, such as physical and sexual abuse, early in life have adverse health outcomes later on in adulthood. But what might surprise you is that in fact quite what we would think of perhaps as quite mild family dysfunction actually has many of the same effects. We study what we call risky families. And these are families that are marked by conflict, cold or non-nurturant parenting, or neglect. And they're not necessarily abusive families. They're regular, ordinary families that you or I might come from, but hopefully don't. Um, and this is, this is what we study. We study them through questionnaires, through um, interviews. Other people do family observations in the household to get teacher ratings. And the evidence is quite consistent and converges on, um, uh, on pretty much the same outcomes. And that is, these are data, by the way, by Vincent, uh, collected by Vincent Felitti on all of Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. And what you see is that the more difficult your childhood was or the more harsh your family environment, the greater your risk for heart disease, for cancer. He finds it for stroke, depression, diabetes, and quite a range of health outcomes. And what's interesting about these data is that family dysfunction is related to risk for these outcomes in a graded fashion. The harsher your early environment, the more at risk you are. Uh, but even at low levels, the risk is significant. So the question that has intrigued our lab is why? It's not immediately clear why your early environment would affect, say, your risk of type 2 diabetes in your 40s, for example, why some people would come down early with it, for example. And so we want to know what roots uh, are, what are the roots by which the impact of early environment is maintained? And what's important about this question is that there is no extant pathology. There is no obvious pathology that you can trace from childhood until you see uh, in the emergence of these conditions. So we focus on several factors. First, we look at um, poor socio-emotional functioning. Um, we also look at alterations in biological stress regulatory systems, uh, and, um, and we look at effects on the brain's processing of stressful information, and we look at uh, genetic factors. Let me say just a little bit about um, a, cu a first couple of these pathways, and then move on to some evidence that I want to give you regarding how the brain manages stress. Um, we find that, well, the first thing to know is that among, uh, th that we all need socio-emotional skills for, for dealing with our environment. We need to be able to read the emotions of others. We need to be able to interpret their emotional states. We need to be able to manage our own emotions. Some people are a lot better at this than other people. Um, and those who are tend also to es establish very good social relationships. They have networks of friends, they attract a partner, and more importantly, they're able to hold on to those networks and partners across the lifespan. Uh, so socio-emotional roots is one of the important vehicles by which we think the effects of the early environment persist. A second route, though, is alterations in stress, uh, in um, alter underlying biological stress regulatory systems, which we think bear the brunt of uh, the impact of the early environment. What you can see is quite early on, um, increases in heart rate and blood, blood pressure to stressful events that other people might not find stressful. You find it especially in men, it tends to develop somewhat later in women. A second factor that you see is an aberrant cortisol response to stress. Cortisol is a stress hormone. What's supposed to happen is when a stressful event occurs, it's supposed to come up and then supposed to come back down. Uh, but in people from risky families, what we often see 
is uh, a flat elevated response. So that people start out with a higher cortisol response, which then fails to show the kind of regulatory pattern that you would expect. So these are two of the pathways. And I want to move on to talk about uh, two specific ones in somewhat more detail. Uh, the third pathway um, is, uh, is how the brain manages stress. Um, we're looking at the pathways of the brain that may connect the early experience, socio-emotional skills, and ultimately neuroendocrine functioning. And then finally, the expression of genes. And what I'm going to do is show you in a minute some surprising evidence regarding how a gene that most people think confers a risk for depression, in fact, is a gene that is responsive to the social environment. Okay, first a little background on the poor socio-emotional skills associated with a risky family. Kids from these families tend to show a high level of avoidant coping, which is to say if they, can, if, they, if they can avoid engaging with a stressor, they will try to do that. But with stressors that they cannot avoid, they will often show an overly aggressive response to stress, often to circumstances that are perceived by other people to be only moderately stressful. They also show an effective coping, that is coping that simply doesn't reduce their emotional distress. And so the question we asked is, is there evidence in the brain for these kinds of processes? We focused on two brain regions that are known to be involved in the regulation of stress responses, and these are the amygdala, which has been tied to threat detection and fear and the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which has been shown to regulate amygdala functioning in the context of fear. And you can think of this roughly as the amygdala is the immediate scared response to a threatening event, and the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex is the, okay, let's think this through, let's manage this, the coping response, if you will. This is um, a paradigm that we use. We have studied uh, people's brains in the scanner as they process threat cues. Um, the, uh, this work was conducted, I should say, in conjunction with Naomi Eisenberger. Um, and in the first task, what we do is simply expose people to these threatening faces. They act as threat cues, and typically you get an immediate amygdala response to a fearful or an angry face. In the second task, we ask them to label the emotions. We say what emotion is being portrayed, and they use a, um, a, uh, uh, an indicator uh, to indicate which, um, which emotion they're looking at. And so what we do is we compare amygdala and right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex activity uh, in people who come from risky families or from more nurturant, supportive families. And here's what we see. First of all, when people are observing faces, this is a task you really don't have to respond to, we find that the people who grow up in the risky families and the harsh environments um, actually have lower amygdala activity than those who grow up in the nurturing family environments. And if you recall, I told you that one characteristic of the coping of these offspring is that they try to tune out stressors, and we think that that's what's going on here. In the labeling task, however, we, which is a task that you can't avoid, you have to engage with it, we see a very different sort of pattern. We see higher amygdala activity in the people from the risky families. And more important, what we see is a very different pattern of, of interaction between the amygdala and the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, we see in nurturant families, the activity in these two regions is negatively related. That's what we expect to see if the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex is doing its job and downregulating threat responses. But what we see in the risky families is a strong positive correlation between activity in these two regions, which suggests that the although uh, people from risky families are recruiting the RVLPFC for managing the threat experience. They are not using it effectively. 
So what this suggests then is that people from risky families try to shut out threatening events when they can, but when they're forced by the demands of the stressful situation to engage, they have stronger amygdala responses and they are not able to recruit the prefrontal cortex for coping effectively with those circumstances. So I want to turn now to um, a little bit of our work on how the early environment can affect the expression of genes that are related to managing a, a threat. And I first want to give you a little bit of background. The gene we're going to be looking at is the serotonin transporter gene. Most of you will know that serotonin is implicated in depression and Prozac and other uh, antidepressants, for example, are thought to operate by controlling reuptake. Uh, the serotonin transporter gene has two alleles. It has a long allele and it has a short allele. And people who have one or two short alleles are thought to be more vulnerable to depression. Uh, and there's some evidence that people who have two short alleles and who have also been uh, subject to a harsh early environment are at particular risk for depression. Now, most of the studies that have looked at these findings are clinical studies. They're done with depressed patients, uh, typically patients who have been diagnosed with major depressive disorder. We have a very different way of approaching this, which is we look at the whole spectrum of families. We're interested in nurturant families as well as, um, as families that have been more harsh. And so the result is we're, we're interested in looking at the whole spectrum of depressive symptoms from none at all to uh, to very much, and what we find is this. If you have two alleles for the serotonin, two short alleles for the serotonin transporter gene, you are indeed significantly more likely to become depressed if you have also experienced early adversity in the family. But the SS combination cuts both ways. So people are significantly less likely to become depressed if they came from a supportive family. So we don't just see an elimination of the risk, we actually see a reversal of the risk such that the SS people appear to be protected. And so what we suggest is that the SS allylic combination, rather than being a risk factor for depression as has been assumed, is in fact responsive to the social environment and whether that environment is nurturant or whether it is harsh. Uh, this was work done with Baldwin Way. We have found three or four other genes that also have allylic combinations that appear to be responsive to the social environment as well. I know we're running late, so let me wind up. So I want to return to the question that spawned our interest here, and it is how can the early environment affect health into adulthood. And as I've noted, there are four, four reasons that we focused on that we think provide some pretty good evidence for the pathways involved here. The first is that the early environment, lead, a, a harsh early environment leads to poor socio-emotional skills, poor, poor emotion regulation skills, poor social skills, limiting people's abilities to manage stressful events effectively. And lacking these skills, people experience stress more strongly, which affects their biological stress regulatory systems, which, have, which show accumulating damage across the lifespan in ways that ultimately compromise the resilience of these systems. Third, uh, the early environment seems to affect how the brain regulates responses to stress. Uh, and I showed you this disturbing pattern of ineffective stress regulation that you see in people who have come from these harsh early environments. And then finally, there is evidence that the expression of genes is implicated such that the early environment affects genes related to stress responses, potentially conferring greater risks in the case of harsh early environments, but benefits in the case of more nurturing environments. Thank you. <laughs>